they never focus okay, on we're it. back, yeah. we're live, we're here. It's a one o'clock, well, it's the 1130 block, I guess you'd say. And uh, I'm Jay Fidel and Think Tech. We're talking about Asia in review. Today we're talking about the Trump meeting, President Trump meeting in Vietnam uh, at the APEC conference, and that's taking place in November of 2017. Uh, special guest for this discussion is a diplomat, a kind of Hawaii special diplomat, okay? And uh, he's the U.S. Uh, senior official of APEC Hawaii, very important person. Russell Hanna, how are you? Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Jay. Thank you for inviting me to the show again, and uh, I'm gr very grateful for coming here. Yeah, great to have you. You give us a dimension we need to have, for sure. So, uh, I guess the principal point of our discussion this morning is there will be an APEC this year in November in Vietnam. Um, and APEC runs around 21 countries, as I recall, and it has a sort of, has a circuit. And it goes from one to the other, not, not two in a row. And uh, this year is, is Vietnam. How is Vietnam selected? Actually, they take turns. Uh, as you know, Jay, there's 21 countries, and uh, they just want to give everybody a fair share. So it's like so they can uh, showcase their uh, country we're hosting. As you know, last year it was in, in, in Peru, and Peru was hosting the, uh, uh, the APEC conference. So this year they passed the torch on to uh, Vietnam. And it's going to be located in, in Da Nang, Vietnam, hmm. which is in the U.S. Be, Air Base was there. Yes, it? yeah. Actually, there was a, a, a port too, yeah. and uh, uh, strategically, they've been using that port for uh, uh, ever since the Vietnam War. Prior to that, when the French was occupying uh, yeah. uh, Vietnam as a Commonwealth country. So, as you know, history. If you look at the history, God. Vietnam, in the first, uh, when they first got civilized was in 1620 when they're the Jesuit. The first uh, Frenchman that visited Vietnam, it was a missionary, and he was a Jesuit, and he brought the Christianity, uh, the Christian religion to Vietnam. And that kind of started the whole Vietnam movement with the French uh, was going in there, and uh, kind of liberated Fr uh, Vietnam, and, uh, and this goes on. They must have been there like close to who knows about 200 years ever since maybe close to 250 yeah, no, years they, they got thrown out in the, the what the 50s actually if you look at the history of uh, jay uh when vietnam was uh being independent uh if you go back when 1941 uh, uh, prior to that uh, when Japan was going through the Shina War and Japan took over Vietnam from 1941 to 45 and what happened was uh, after the war uh, there was a famous general Ho Chi Minh oh we know him and he's the one that liberated uh, Vietnam to become independent and being a sovereign country so as you know after the war of uh, uh, World War II, uh, Ho Chi Minh wanted to uh, become, uh, he thought it was a big chance now to be liberated and getting away from France. Yeah. And uh, the French start coming back again since uh, it wasn't occupied under Japan during the World War II. And this was in like 1945 and 1946. Uh, and they were brutal. And they went up to the north side, uh, up in North uh, Vietnam. And they, they're, and they're kind of in, being, uh, and the Russians were kind of aiding them as well, and giving them military equipment, and as uh, they were kind of helping them out as well. Helping Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh. Yeah. And uh, if you look at it, then, and what happened was, then the United States was teaming up with uh, France, and because uh, France was kind of leaving uh, Indo. French Indochina, which was, uh, they had a lot of influence with Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And, and they were Thailand. an ally in the war, yeah, so they we were, were closer to them because of that. Yes, exactly. And uh, hopefully when they found that Ho Chi Minh wanted to become independent, sovereign nation, uh, he fought the French, and they, and he, they beat him. At Dien Bien, Dien Bien Phu. Yep. The famous battle it, it routed the French out of Vietnam. Exactly. And I, at the time, and I guess the French wanted to leave the Indo, uh, uh, the French Indonesia area because they wanted to go to Africa. They wanted to go to Middle East with the uh, the foreign legions, and uh, they were trying to. Uh, uh, they wanted to get out of Asia. So what happens? The United States. They're asking the United States to carry on. And Ho Chi Minh himself wanted to uh, team up with the United States and become uh, partners. But what happened was the United States went with the French. 
So Ho Chi Minh decided to go with the Chinese and with Mao Tse Tung at the time. Mean. And as you know, Ho Chi Minh was very educated and he was uh, trained under the Russians as well, uh, was educated in Russia uh, for learning the Communist Party mm. uh, with uh, Leningrad and when uh, uh, Joseph Stalin was in power. So he was learning a lot about the Communist Party. So he became the, like the, one of the leaders between the Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. So after the war of 1940, uh, when Ho Chi Minh took over and beat the uh, French, and they became sub, uh, they well, started in what 49 or 50, something like that. Right. It was like because uh, the Vietnam War with the United States when we got involved with in 1955, and uh, you know we're working with the South Vietnam. And the South Viet and the, so North was sending them uh, some of the Chinese Vietnamese. They call the Viet Cong. So we're fighting the Viet Cong in the South Vietnam, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that kind of uh, it's a little confusing. But you know, in terms of history, but it's, it's kind of a similar format. What happened with between the, the violence North, wasn't confusing. Yeah, between there was plenty the, of violence in exactly those days. Like with what we've seen within the North Korea and South Korea. Yeah, yeah. Good thing that then happened. Like you know, they didn't bring the border, and uh, I think it was a seven. Parallel between North and South Korea that they had a boundary, but uh, they became it with the peace treaty. I think what happened was 1973 uh, uh, after we got overthrow, we signed an agreement with the Paris Agreement in Paris, and they wanted to liberate the. Uh, 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 Vietnam to become independent, a sovereign nation, and the U.S. Congress took up on this Case Church Amendment, this agreement that saying that we're not going to, we're going to pull away, we're going to pull out of Vietnam and not have a war with them, and with, as well with Cambodia and Laos. So every time we're, we're going to go into war with uh, Vietnam or Cambodia and Laos, it has to go through the Congress for approval. So then 1975 came, uh, that's when the war of Vietnam was over. Yeah. And hopefully, the uh, U.S. Uh, pulled out, and we have so many immigration immigrants coming to the United States. I would say right now, we have about one point, close to two million immigrants that came because of the Vietnam War, that's yeah. living as a Vietnamese Americans that live in the United States. In Hawaii, we have roughly close to about uh, 18 or 20,000 uh, Vietnamese Americans living in Hawaii. So we have a big community here. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this present day, uh, we, they have a Vietnamese Chamber of Commerce here that's bridging the gap with Vietnam and United States. They're law-abiding citizens, they're well-educated. Uh, so, you know, and they be, they're part of the ethnic chamber here, mm -hmm. and we have an ethnic chamber in Hawaii yeah, with part the of, Japanese part chamber, of our fabric for sure. Korean chamber as so well. So talk about Chinese the economics chamber. in Vietnam, because APEC is primarily directed at, it's the Asia Pacific Economic uh, Council, no? APEC? Yeah, APEC is, uh, uh, we have a conf uh, APEC summit coming in November, and it involves 21 countries. And uh, Vietnam is a member of the. They've been force. successful. Yeah, their it's economy is good. It's still a communist country, but it's it's a moderate co communist country, and there's a certain amount of capital investment going on. Yeah, yeah. if you look at the uh, in the growth within the past 30 years that uh, Vietnam's been having, they've been growing like uh, uh, close to six to eight percent. Uh, early, and we project that according to the economists uh, uh, that specialize in Vietnam, uh, the data shows that they're going to be growing another six to eight percent ten years from now. That's so pretty they're, good. They're, they're, they're having a robustity of their economy. Lot, you know, they're having more growth than China. And if you look at their commodities and uh, manufacturing, uh, a lot of the labor. In China are getting too expensive, so they're all moving into China, uh, Vietnam for like apparels or clothing. So or China textile. is outsourcing to Vietnam. Exactly, our clothes, our rubber manufacturing, or uh, a lot of stuff are kind of uh, going to Vietnam. Like before, it was Indonesia or India. Like if you look at your clothes and our trademark country of origin, a lot of them are uh, stitched and manufactured. Uh, steam stress uh, kind of work is done in Vietnam, mm -hmm. and you look at our apparels, like our clothing. 
clothing, our shirts that we wear, that what we buy at the uh, department stores and stuff. That you, a lot of them are made in Vietnam. So uh, you see that uh, a lot of manufacturing are done in Vietnam now for uh, tangible goods that we consume here. What about Hawaii's uh, economic connection with Vietnam? I can tell you, I had a client once who owned some property in Hawaii. He was actually from another Pacific area, and he came to Hawaii invested and one day he told me he said you know Hawaii's nice but Vietnam is where you can make some money took all his investment into Vietnam made a lot of money in Vietnam how about that yeah I think and you know what came out of that Jay was because in 2013 we signed a Vietnam comprehensive uh, agreement uh, when Barack Obama was a president and he had a manufactured visit there uh, in 2016 to kind of follow up on that comprehensive agreement ever since that uh, if you look at the 20 years that you know, in the protocol and diplomacy that we had with the State Department. In 1995, we officially opened a, a U.S. Embassy in uh, Hanoi and was able to send an ambassador there, and vice versa, uh, Vietnam was able to open an embassy in Washington. Prior to that, it was like a, a consulate with uh, San Francisco. Vietnam had a consulate in San yeah, yeah, Francisco. Yeah. And, and it was a cold shoulder. And we had a little consulate in Washington. And we were giving them the city, cold shoulder for a long a time. So at the time being. It's all very positive what happened, and uh, good for us that we ameliorated what, what was a cold shoulder after the war. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so you know, you know that uh, the uh, Scheidler College of Business has a regular. It has it has a facility in Ho Chi Minh City. It teaches businessmen and women in in Vietnam how to do business. It is responsible for a number of the education of a number of CEOs who are effectively running the country. So we have a good business relationship with Vietnam. They like us. We like them. Uh, it's a, a mutual mutual engagement. And so, uh, you know, it's interesting. What happens is you have a war, and then in the aftermath of the war, you get closer, closer than you might have been otherwise. Yeah. We had to spend some lives, like 50,000 mm -hmm. lives mm -hmm. in that war. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the moment, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a, 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 as you said, a, a robust relationship mm -hmm. with, uh, with yeah, Vietnam. Yeah, exactly, Jay. If you look at the history, the, the Romans would call it uh, Pax Romana, which means peace after war. And yeah. what happens is, like, we go there, and we kind of get into war, we kind of mess up their country, so we want to rebuild the country after for bringing peace and prosperity. Yeah. And Romans used to do that when they used to uh, conquer their uh, eastern, western Europe, yeah. and they used to build the Great Wall or the yeah. Road of Hayden's yeah. Road, you know, so in those kind of aspects, uh, uh, you know, it's not a good way of saying Pax Romana, but I think in, in historically, you know, that's the approach that uh, civilized nations take, you know, develop yeah. countries countries that's been in power. And, and it's, a, it's an advantage that we have. We might as well take advantage of that advantage. It's an opportunity um, to build a long-term relationship with them. Therefore, um, you know, on all of this, uh, Obama went there for, for uh, APEC, right? Uh, or he went, yeah, he went, what, he went to Vietnam. What did he do there? Actually, he went there to just to follow up on when he was— It was uh, not for APEC. It was just for a, a diplomatic meeting. Yeah, there was a diplomatic uh, relation, and I think he one of the few presidents that actually visit there uh, to break the ice after yeah. the— uh, Yeah, good for him. Since we've been hiding, haven't been in the diplomatic channel for yeah. a while, because ever since the 1995, uh, when he signed that agreement for the comprehensive agreement in, in yeah. uh, 2003, we didn't have a—we had a 20 years of relationship now. Yeah, you know, that's hopefully. fabulous. Yeah. So, we, we, you know, here we are sort of on the cusp of what could be a, a long-term connection with a strategic important place economically and geopolitically uh, in, in Asia. And uh, it's coming up in November, and the word is that Trump is going to go. And right after this break, I want to I talk about that and the implications, why he's going to go, what he could achieve, and the likelihood of success of some sort in, in connection with that trip. That's Russell Hanna. He's a senior, a U.S. senior official for APEC in Hawaii. We're talking about uh, the Trump meeting in Vietnam. We've set the stage. We'll be right back after this break, and we'll, we'll drill down. We'll be right back. from the foundation. 
destination for a better life. Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech, and we're doing Asia in Review, talking about the Trump meeting, which is coming up later this year in Vietnam, uh, the, uh, the APEC meeting in Vietnam. And our special guest is Russell Hanma. Uh, he is the U.S. Uh, senior official for APEC in Hawaii. And are you going to go, Russell? Are you going to go there for that meeting? Yes? Yeah, hopefully if they send me the right credentials. And, uh, you know, a matter of fact, I, you know, I've sent my uh, resume for, uh, to Donald Trump and Trump administration as well. So uh, he, I know that he's still got to fulfill a lot of his uh, cabinet position, appointed position with the State Department. And we just got our, our United States Trade Representative, uh, Robert Lighthizer. And I'm sure he's looking for a lot of good uh, staff to work under him as well. So we'll see how his appointments go. Yeah, I hope, I hope they go because he hasn't appointed a lot of people. And we need to have a, a strong, experienced Akamai um, State Department and, and officials like your own self uh, out there building relationships with all these countries or maintaining them. Uh, and he has a way of uh, making statements that don't help sometimes, as we know from his Twitter feed, uh, tweets. Um, but let's talk about, you know, what he could achieve. Let's say he did the right thing to go. First of all, it's a good idea to go, don't you think? The American president should go to APEC in Vietnam. You know, we want to have a certain relationship with them. We should have a presence there, don't you think? Yeah, I think so. He already made an official statement of, uh, that he was going uh, through the State Department, through his uh, White House uh, uh, spokesperson, or said that he is going to attend, because ev eventually at the time there's going to be East Asia Summit as well. It, and, in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, in that part, in Vietnam. So what, usually when the APEC conference happens, there's the, another uh, East Asia summit with the ASEAN countries, so it kind of so they don't waste their time. The leaders can get together and uh, discuss a lot of the, have a dialogue about the issues that they're involved with, and when they're strategically they can reposition themselves. So I think in our case, uh, well, you know, Donald uh, President Donald Trump knows that uh, the relationship uh, with Vietnam, and uh, as you know, our generation, we're the post-war generation of Vietnam who are running the country right now. So mm -hmm. in that generation. Uh, we want to bring peace to Vietnam and close the chapter because we were involved in a, uh, a war a that should have been there. A bad time know. for everyone. Exactly. Uh, but, but you know, the, the funny thing is, you go through the history, and I really appreciate you doing that, of, of Vietnam and how Vietnam fits with the rest of Southeast Asia, how it fits with the United States, its history, with Europe, with France. Um, a lot of people don't know. They forget. The other generation, and even the generation running things, may not know exactly what happened and how those 50,000 American troops died, uh, and, and how sore it is, and, and how we have to, we have to ho'oponopono, you know, fix it up. Uh, and maybe this is an opportunity to do that. What, what doesn't ring true for me is that he's an isolationist. Uh, he's, he's, he's breaking, breaking the, you know, the ties with people all over the world, making statements that are alienating people. He's not very good at diplomatic relations or diploma diplomatic conduct. So although you got to give him credit for deciding to go, you wonder how he'll be able to handle it. I mean, if you were Donald Trump, how would you handle it in November? Actually, for Donald Trump, or the president, uh, he already met the prime minister from uh, Vietnam, Nguyen Puc. He just, uh, uh, they met him about two weeks ago. In Washington. In Washington. He came by and uh, just to show that good gesture that uh, they want to keep working together uh, in terms of uh, maybe they Here's might a picture of that meeting, yeah. And uh, I think the relation, and I know that um, uh, President Smith say that it's, uh, you know, it's very important, it's vital that we have a good relationship with Vietnam, and we have a good uh, Vietnamese-American uh, community in, in, in the United States, as well in Hawaii, who, who want to strengthen the relationship. And uh, as you know, Vietnam is changing right now. 
from a communist regime to socialist democratic reform. So we know that uh, Vietnam is going to play that major role, and they're shying away from China. And so, uh, so they you know they want to work with the United States. They prefer the United yes, States to China. They, yes. They Why wanna, is that, from their point of view? I think they learned through all the history what went through, and uh, they know that uh, being more democracy, being more open, and working within the international community, it's going to benefit them as well. Mm -hmm. And if, even with tourism, we have uh, ever since the uh, two thousand. 13 comprehensive agreement that we signed with Vietnam. Tourism increased. We have more direct flight with Vietnam Airlines. Uh, roughly, we have about 80,000 visitors coming yearly from Vietnam. And out of that, I would say 19,000 uh, are students who are studying, uh, uh, going to school in the United States. And so we're glooming a lot of these young leaders that's coming out from mm, Vietnam. That's great. Yeah. And, and I think uh, that's and a they're, good they're thing. they're connected with us by virtue of the fact there are almost two million Vietnamese uh, in the country, mm -hmm. um, most of whom are, um, you know, valuable players in the country. They go to school, they learn, they participate mm -hmm. in the economy and all that. But <clears throat> the question I put to you is, you know, what can Trump achieve to make a special trip here, to make this trip special? I think Trump's got to show not only showing that uh, his interest in Vietnam, he's got to show that his interest in Asia Pacific region yeah. and bringing peace to the region and prosperity or, and what United States can play as a major role. I know that we're pushing in terms of trade and commerce that uh, we're focusing more on the bilateral trade agreement with Vietnam. As you know, the United States was a member with TPP, Trans-Pacific well, Partnership. Pulled out of that. And Vietnam is a member of TPP. So it's a problem, isn't it? And, uh, but they realize that uh, they want to work with the United States. And, anyway, uh, in, in on a bilateral of, basis. On a bilateral basis. And, see if, and, and I, as you know, right now, uh, TPP, they had a meeting uh, uh, in Vietnam with the trade ministers, uh, and they discussed that uh, on the sidelines with the trade ministers, saying that uh, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand is going to proceed with the TPP, and hopefully they're going to uh, persuade all the other 11 members who are signatory members, and hopefully they can wish that uh, maybe United States will eventually join in again, go back to TPP. Yeah. So well, a, we have an option there. Yeah, uh, it's an option, but it's not likely in this administration. And it, it's likely, I think, in the next administration, especially if there's a reaction vote against Trump. Um, but, you know, it seems to me that when you, you know, threaten to pull out of NATO, when you do pull out of TPP, when you reject the Paris Accord, you're isolating this country. Uh, you're cutting ties that we spent years and years of diplomatic effort to, to create in the first place. Very hard to get back where it used to be. We lose franchise. We lose respect in the global community. Um, and what's worse is these organizations go on Hopefully, I mean, I hope they do, without us. We, it may hurt them that we leave. It may hurt NATO, it may hurt uh, TPP, it may hurt, you know, uh, various thing, various organizations that he's backing out of. Um, but the reality is that they will continue without us, don't you think? And that's what will happen with TPP, won't it? Yeah, I think in terms of we did, you know, we might lose our credibility and our trust with our international yeah. partners and our allies. Uh, but I think they're, you know, they're intelligent enough to know the leadership role, and uh, they know that uh, Donald Trump is playing that uh, different kind of leadership role. So I, I know the leaders are kind of, uh, you know, trying to have a relationship with uh, our president. Yeah, well, I and wanted to ask you that, you know, because, you know, this is a very interesting picture, um, and it's an interesting uh, phenomenon that uh, that he met with the leader of Vietnam, right, a couple of weeks mm -hmm. ago. But what do the Vietnam Vietnamese think about, what do they think about us today? What do they think about, you know, uh, having economic relations with us? What do they think about having mutual security with us? And what do they think about Trump? That's the big question. Mm -hmm. Uh, are they going to really do business, or are they just biding the time for another president? I think in terms of, you know, you got to understand the dynamics of the private sector and the public sector. In terms of public sector, the government, and uh, we have our government official, we have our protocol, we have our embassy, we have all these think tank agencies that's working around that. And then you have our private sector that's doing business, uh, our, our U.S. Chamber, of Commerce, our top 500 uh, blue chip companies that's doing business. And we're, you know, we're going to continue 
on. I don't think in terms of private business, in terms of uh, trade or import-export, uh, Vietnam is a specialized uh, general systems preference uh, country, so they don't pay tariffs or anything. And now they got out of that, and now we're trying to come up with the U.S.-Vietnam uh, trade agreement, besides having that comprehensive agreement in 2013. So I think when they meet on the sidelines at the uh, APEC conference in November, our president, uh, Donald Trump, Rex Tillerson, the Secretary of State, and our United States Trade Representative, uh, Robert Leidenhauser, uh, can uh, work uh, with their counterpart, with their leaders, and maybe come up with a better deal, or in terms of a bilateral trade agreement. So, I China's. mean, could it be legitimately argued that the U.S. is better off with a bilateral agreement than being part of TPP? Uh, if you, I mean, you know, if you look at the difference uh, to my experience, uh, bilateral, you know, United States as a whole, we're a big country. Uh, you know, uh, I would say 80 percent, 85 percent are domestic demand. You know, maybe 15 to 20 percent might be export oriented uh, in terms of cost of goods sold, in terms of generating revenues for those con uh, for those uh, industries. Uh, but. Uh, but if you look at the multilateral, like con commingle with different countries, uh, maybe uh, we can do our joint ventures, uh, make it a high caliber of kind of trade agreements that uh, in terms of pharmaceutical uh, painter licensing fees or uh, intellectual property rights. Uh, on this, we know which countries This would are. be in a, in a, a bilateral yeah. trade agreement? Yeah, in terms of bilateral, we do have those terms, but if you have those like TPP, which is a multilateral, involves so many different countries, yeah. and they have to have the same standards. Yeah, so Small maybe it's countries. easier to do a, a bilateral because there's only two countries Involved, yeah. yeah, that's our traditional way we've been doing our trade agreements. It's been yeah. bilateral. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, and, you know, if you look at our competitive edge and looking at the whole business structure of import, export, international uh, uh, trade agreements, uh, bilateral will supersede. supersede yeah. uh, uh, and I put that on my APEC master plan, dude. Mm -hmm. I did mention about having each country participate in the uh, TPP, but first we should do the bilateral agreement to make sure there's no misunderstanding, our terms and conditions are solid, and then we can proceed with the multilateral. Right, and maybe uh, a different range of issues in the, in the, in the multilateral, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one thing that just strikes me, we're almost out of time here, but one thing that just strikes me is that some countries may resent the fact that we do bilaterals agreements with other members of T TPP and not with them. Um, some countries may be jealous or competitive and feel that the U.S. is favoring, say, in this case, Vietnam and not favoring, say, Laos, say, uh, you know, Myanmar, say, I don't know, Thailand. Um, is that, does that happen? Is there a, sort of a, a, a competition and a resentment? I think there's some, you know, I'm sure each country has their favoritism. Uh, if you look at China, for example, they're pushing the RCEP, RCEP Regional Comprehensive Economic uh, Partnership with the ASEAN countries. So, so they might have a competitive edge over the ASEAN countries because they've been, you know, they have a lot of Chinese descendants living there as a one China policy, and they're pushing for that one belt, one road initiative with the, uh, the BRICS countries and with the uh, Asian Infrastructure uh, Investment Bank that they're pushing for. So, you know, those kind of things, they might be having that certain favoritism as well. Yeah. And we have ours in, with our allies and our partners, and TPP was one of them. Well, so one minute left, okay? Can you address the people and tell the people what they should be thinking about APEC, what they should be thinking about Trump's visit to Vietnam in November? Well, you know, I just wanted to highlight this, that uh, it's, a, it's vital for us, the United States, to work with Vietnam, uh, not because of the history of the Vietnam War, but in, in terms of region, uh, we want to help countries who wants to open up, be part of the uh, international community. As you know, Vietnam, the people over there are caring people, uh, they're loving caring, and they're into human rights right now, and uh, and they want to they do good. Uh, because because what you know, the ugliness they went through with the war, and how they've been reviving and uh, putting their effort. And as we, as you know, all the other neighboring countries want to make sure that all the Asian countries are go, gonna be working together. And I think Vietnam plays that role.
Yeah, that's great. And, um, you know, I hope that uh, President sees it the same way and that he actually advances our interest and relationship in November. We'll be watching him, and you'll be watching him. Russell Hanma, uh, U.S. Senior Official for APEC in Hawaii. Thank you so much, Russell. Thank you, Jay. Thanks for coming down. Yeah. Aloha. Aloha.